Coming up on Tech News Weekly, deep fakes and cheap fakes and the tools that love them. Also, a spreadsheet is apparently making the rounds at Microsoft for sharing salaries. Apple Arcade has launched. Will it survive subscription fatigue? Is a podcast a podcast when it's voiced by AI? And Micah has a surprise to share, and it's quite appealing. That up next on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 100, recorded Thursday, September 19th, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Microsoft Mechanics, the official show from Microsoft for tech enthusiasts, IT pros, and software architects. Get deep dives from the engineers behind the tech, or just learn the essentials of the latest from Microsoft. Visit aka.ms slash tnwmechanics to watch and subscribe today. And by Cashfly, give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with Cashfly CDN and be 30% faster than a competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news today. Woo! <laughs> I'm Micah Sargent and this is episode 100. <laughs> I'm Jason Howell. Don't, you know, I brought a green noisemaker <gasps> for you. I don't know if you want it. Go I ahead. love it. Go ahead, give it a two. <laughs> All right, great. Thank this you. is what we do for episode 100, apparently. Just a little uh, little noise making. And that's it. That's it. That's all, all you right. get. The technological boogeyman of the modern age appears to be deep fakes. On one hand, it's intriguing and powerful technology that's becoming rapidly democratized. On the other hand, the implications for the health of democracy itself, among other potentially damaging applications, can lead one down a path of fear and doubt, particularly as it improves uh, with every passing day. This stuff's getting really good. The focus as of late has shifted towards accepting their place in modern technology, along with uh, effective detection of deep deep fakes in order to limit the damage that could be inflicted by their negative applications. And joining us to talk about the systems that are being put into place to detect these deep fakes is Britt Paris, co-author of the new Data Society report titled Deep Fakes and Cheap Fakes. Welcome, Britt. Hi, thanks for having me. We're uh, It's a pleasure to get you on. Thank you so much for carving out some time to talk with us today. So uh, personally, like I'm, I'm fascinated by deep fakes. Mm -hmm. Anytime there's a new deep fake story making the rounds, like I'm, I'm equally like interested and, and fascinated, but also kind of slightly mortified of, of what could happen here. I'm aware of deep fakes. Your report is the first time that I personally heard the term cheap fake. So can you start by maybe sharing some of the major differences between the two? Sure. So the report really looks at uh, a broad range of audiovisual manipulation or what we call audiovisual manipulation. So the deep fakes that we're all familiar with um, are artificial intelligence reliant techniques um, to graft faces, primarily faces onto existing videos. Um, but, you know, it can also include voices or grafting faces onto already extant bodies and videos. Um, those are the deep fakes that we are aware of. Um, but cheap fakes, the term that we coin or use to talk about uh, or cheap fakes is what we uh, use to talk about more conventional methods of audiovisual manipulation. Um, like speeding up or slowing down footage, staging footage, or you know, having mm -hmm. someone stand in for another person uh, to recontextualize that footage. Mm -hmm. um, so these cheap fakes are the more accessible forms of audiovisual manipulation, and they're not, you know, technically sophisticated, but they work to play with context. And like I say, they use lookalike stand-ins, relabeling footage of one event or one person as another. Um, and through doing this, media creators, um, you know, if we want to put it very uh, loosely, can easily manipulate an audience's interpretation of these videos. Absolutely. We're seeing this more and more. We're seeing it kind of in, in some many ways baked into, you know, just everyday, like so even social media products are starting to kind of head in these directions and do really kind of uh, interesting manipulative uh, visual effects like this. Now, you say that fakes and media are nothing new, which makes a lot of sense. But talk, talk a little bit about the historical perspective here. Um, 
is now any different than the past? It really feels very potent right now, but is that any different? In some ways it is, but in some ways, and it's, it's an extension of, you know, old struggles over uh, power over evidence. So we talk about um, in the 1850s, whenever uh, photography was invented and people were starting to think about using photographic evidence in court and courts and judges mistrusted this technology because they didn't understand it and they preferred um to have someone stand in on a case-by-case -case basis to explain the technology and what they were seeing and what's being captured in the technology, um, you know, really uh, relied on these expert interpretations of these videos, which were obviously, you know, often flawed. Um, and then, you know, we fast forward to the 1990s where broadcast media is complicit in recontextualizing or miscontextualizing or, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, playing with evidence um, in a number of different ways. The example that we use is uh, the Gulf War and coverage around the, the 1991 Gulf War, where uh, broadcast media constructed this conflict that seemed like it was a conflict between evenly matched adversaries, um, but, you know, indeed it wasn't. But these were real images, but what was manipulative about them um, was that, the, you know, how they were contextualized, interpreted, and broadcast around the clock on table television to uphold the political decisions of, you know, the government, the status quo. Um, so that's sort of a quick overview of the history that we go over. There are a lot of other specific examples, but... Um, you know, today we are able to manipulate videos and images using machine learning, um, and these uh, results are now most almost impossible to detect by the human eye. Um, and now, you know, anyone with a public media, public social media profile is fair game to be faked. And once these fakes exist um, online, they can go viral on social media in a matter of seconds, and they're really hard to take down uh, if it's if that's you know something that's necessary. Mm. So, so spe speaking to that virality, I mean, is do, do you sort of consider this part of of the the whole idea of a deep fake? Because a deep fake on its own that that doesn't sort of uh, have legs then just sort of disappears into the masses. So it's kind of like a, a positive and negative of the internet here. Um, so when you talk about deep fakes, are you primarily talking about ones tied to the virality of being shared across the, the landscape? Those seem to be the ones that have more power, obviously. Um, and is that kind of where the focus is on, on deep fakes, is, is getting uh, a manipulated video out there and then making sure that it goes out to, to, to the audience? Or is it more of like a, uh, a focused, uh, less, less about the, the virality, but more about just like, oh, I want to create this video and I want to you know, share it as evidence in like a court, for example, versus social. So kind of, I know that that question is a little confusing, but do we do we see it more as a method to share with the masses or are these deep fakes kind of being used in smaller contexts more often? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, and in the report, we talk about um, how faked images, you know, deep fakes included, um, are interpreted as evidence or sort of interpreted as expression in different scenarios. And the real problematic scenarios are when faked images are interpreted as evidence and, you know, reach wide audiences at the speed and scale of social media, uh, you know, to the point that, you know, it's really hard to, to not talk about them, right? Um, because they must be addressed. Um, in terms of, you know, I guess what we've seen thus far, a lot of the times the deep fakes, these um, videos, these fake videos made with machine learning techniques that we've seen being spread and uh, talked about in the media are ones that are primarily expressive. Um, but there are more and more examples um, of these videos that exist on pornography sites um, and to, to lesser degrees over social media, but they still do exist. Um, and these are videos, you know, they can be of uh, public figures, but sometimes they aren't. Yeah. Now, um, 
obviously, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence systems, these are all being used to great effect to create these things. Now we're seeing these systems being created to detect them. How effective are they? How much should humans be involved in this process? I know there's a lot of work right now around AI being able to detect, you know, the subtleties of a deep fake and be able to determine that this is in fact a fake. And this is a, a big push. It's kind of part of the, the warfare against the, the potential damage of these things. But are we headed in the right direction as far as those systems are concerned, in your opinion? Right. And so this is one of the big things that we talk about also in the report. Um, you know, most of these uh, AI detection mechanisms uh, work to detect deep fakes at the point of capture. So whether or not something, you know, has been deep faked, um, it doesn't, they don't really address how things are disseminated or used as evidence. And indeed, you know, there's no artificial intelligence uh, mechanism that I've seen thus far that can determine how people will interpret some faked images as evidence and others as protected free expression. And this is sort of the issue uh, that this report gets at. Um, you know, while technical fixes, um, you know, determining pixels and, uh, you know, whether or not something's been faked or where it comes from is useful, but it doesn't go that far in terms of, you um, you know, stopping the spread of harmful images necessarily. Right, right. Now, uh, another you know term that's that's coming up a lot in it, in a whole variety of facets in the world of technology is regulation. Everything appears to be in the target of regulation right now, or at least people th seem to think that that's the solution for a lot of control over parts of technology that maybe they're afraid of or that are just growing so rapidly that they don't know what else you know would be effective. What do you think? Do you think uh, deep fake technology should be regulated? And if so, what? What should or would that law look like in order to be at all effective at this point? Um, so this may not be an incredibly popular opinion, uh, but I think deep fake technology is something that should be regulated only in tandem with uh, the regulation of larger platform companies uh, that have, you know, gained a lot of economic um power by making it so that, you know, viral novel videos um, are rewarded uh, by achieving massive speeds and scales. Um, and I think that any sort of meaningful regulation would have to hold these different tech companies accountable uh, for the way that they uh, do incentivize maybe, you know, bad faith sharing of content. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would probably share uh, your opinion as far as that's concerned. We're seeing a lot sure. of the, the damage that, that can be done uh, through just the sheer network effect and these things in collaboration with each other. And it just really seems like it's a it's a it's a messy soup. Um Britt, I really appreciate you taking time. I know that you have to go. Datasociety.net is where people can go to find your report. Again, the title of the report, the report is Deep Fakes and Cheap Fakes. Everybody should definitely take a look at it. If you're at all interested in this emerging technology, it's definitely a great report to, uh, to read through. Britt, where do you want people to find you online if they want to follow the work that you're doing? Um, sure. They could follow me on Twitter at at D R B R I T T P A R I S, Dr. Britt Paris. Awesome. Britt, thank you for taking the time. We really appreciate it and best of luck. Thank you. We'll talk to Take you care. soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Up next, Microsoft employees are sharing their salaries with one another to negotiate for better pay. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Microsoft Mechanics, Microsoft's official show about the latest Microsoft tech. Every week, they do engineering deep dives on the latest tech announcements from Microsoft. They touch on trending IT topics and bring you detailed step-by-step multi-part tutorials. So one example is the recent series for Windows Virtual Desktop or large-scale Windows and Office deployment. 
Now, these aren't your usual rambling how-to videos or off-the-cuff tech interviews like Tech News Weekly. These are carefully crafted verbally and visually with demos and how it works graphical explanations. They pack it all in. This is valuable stuff. Most are under 15 minutes, so they get to the point without wasting your time. They're like the visual Cliff's Notes for Microsoft tech. That sounds awesome. And the best part? It's free. You're going to want to check out everything from the latest Surface devices, database architectures, management and admin tools, productivity innovation, and more across Microsoft's complete range of products and services for business. And if you're going to go to Microsoft Ignite in Orlando this November, the mechanics team will be presenting live every day with engineering and product leaders Mark Rosanovich, Aaron Chappell, Brad Anderson, Julia White, Rob Lefferts, and more so you can see the tech in action behind the announcements. So whether you're a tech enthusiast, IT professional, or architect looking to stay up to date, you visit aka.ms slash TNW Mechanics today and subscribe. That's aka.ms slash TNW Mechanics or subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Watch Microsoft Mechanics, your free go-to source to discover the latest Microsoft tech. Now, almost 400 full-time employees at Microsoft are sharing their salaries anonymously with one another in an effort to guarantee they're being fairly compensated. And while that may sound a little surprising to some, salary sharing is reportedly common at Microsoft. Dave Gershgorn wrote about his scoop for One Zero. Hello, Dave. Hey, how's it going? Thanks oh, for having me. Yeah, we're happy to have you here. Thank you. Um, up first, uh, in the article, you did provide a little bit more information than simply saying sources close to the matter talked about this. So I believe you received access to the document by way of a former employee and had it confirmed by a current employee, right? Yes, that's true. Um, and actually, we saw the spreadsheet itself. So we were able to do some analysis on the numbers and we found uh, that some, some broad trends in the, in the data. Um, there is a lot of compensation that comes in the form of stock and cash. So, um, but that changes as, the, as a, an employee's uh, career progresses. So um, while you might make a, a certain percentage of your compensation in stock, when you are a you know a, a younger employee, as you continue on with the company, uh, that percentage becomes larger and larger. Uh, yeah. So actually, I wanted to to kind of dig in a little bit. Um, what are some of the data points that were actually in the spreadsheet itself? So you know, you mentioned a few of them, but sort of what is the information? Because this is being shared anonymously between employees, correct? Yes. Yeah. So some of the data points were. Um, I mean. It, it, the things that we saw in the spreadsheet, which were helpful to the employees, were, were the level, which is a private indicator, um, as well as your public-facing role, uh, your organization that you work in outside of uh, or within Microsoft, um, compensation that's broken down into uh, base pay, uh, cash bonus, and stock bonus. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we, we saw in the spreadsheet itself. When you talk about the average person who is in the spreadsheet, um, they were uh, a level 62, which means that they were um, someone who has a few years of experience but isn't a senior level um, employee. And they made a total compensation of probably, you know, south of $200,000, but around $150,000 in, in uh, base pay. So um, the that was like the average that we saw, but there are definite outliers. And obviously not everyone is compensated to the uh, to the same extent. Um, what we saw were a lot of, of variability, especially as you got more uh, senior and um, as you stayed with the company for sure. Interesting. Now, one of the data points that was not on the spreadsheet was gender. Um, I'm curious, do you have any th any thought on why that was left off the spreadsheet? Is this a matter of trying to anonymize and making sure that there isn't that data there to sort of uh, connect the dots? Or is there something else involved here? Because this is typically a data point that matters when we're talking about equal compensation. Mm-hmm. 
Totally. Yeah, I don't have a, a concrete answer for that, but I will say that Levels.fyi, which is the website whose founders I spoke to for the story, do collect gender data, and they're going to be doing a more detailed analysis on that information uh, by the end of the year. So I think that um, the trend of salary sharing is something that is becoming more and more common. It's happening at Google. Um, we now know it's happening at Microsoft pretty regularly, um, and I'm sure it's going on elsewhere, as you can see on the level fyi page um so as more and more people submit that information i think we're gonna have a much better look at the gender breakdown uh in terms of uh how people are compensated and com and workers will be able to act on that information hmm. now um one thing i noticed you know in reading through here and you know it on, on a certain level, it makes sense. Say a job pays fifty thousand dollars in one region or a position, a role plays pays fifty thousand in one region and one hundred fifty thousand in another. It might be easier, you know, easy for someone to say, "Hey, well, that's unfair. They should be paid the same, right?" With disregarding cost of living and all those other things. Is there any indication that you've gathered from any Microsoft employees that you've talked to about this, about how they feel about that discovery? Does it feel unfair to to read that, or is there some level of understanding that, hey, well, you know, living here and living there, of course, you know, pay is going to be different between those two regions, or maybe that's the wrong approach. But what do you think? Yeah, I think that there's an understanding that the, the cost of living is different. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's difficult to say that someone with similar experience shouldn't be compensated to the same level as someone who is uh, working a very similar job with a similar, you know, in a similar field doing very similar work. And they're just geographically different. I mean, when you talk about the distribution of work around the world and, and how companies are more remote and you have people not coming into the main office, um, still making high, you know, or I guess mid six figures. Um, and then someone in a similar situation who just happens to be in a different country um, is making you know a quarter of that. It's I, I think it's a little bit difficult to justify when you're uh, as truly of a, a global of a company as Microsoft. Yeah. yeah. Now you're one right. of the the data points, and you actually did bring that up, is this sort of what esoteric uh, employee level type thing. Um, yeah. And and it kind of you saw that as a trend shows it determines uh, total compensation. So I was hoping that you could sort of explain that and how it does or does not relate to seniority at, at this company. And then you also mentioned some other companies and how their uh, employee level works. Yeah, so this is something that I'm, I'm still working on understanding completely. It's something that's very well known within the tech industry. And I've had people DM me on Twitter being like, I can't believe you didn't know all about these levels. And, you know, what every level means at every company. Um, I think that's part of the levels FYI. Um, I found them to be genuinely helpful in reporting this. But the so levels differ at every company and they are a pretty much a, a, a measurement of seniority. Um, so, but the thing is that the scale at every company is different. So it makes it very difficult for tech workers to actually understand how senior they are at the company in relation to other companies. So Facebook, I believe, works on a scale from like E3 to E9. Microsoft is a scale from 58 to 80. And 80 is like a technical fellow who's like, you know, someone who's almost like the, the most senior coder or, you know, architect of this, uh, these systems at the company. So, um, it, you know, it's a one through 10 at some places at Amazon. It's like, a, I think I believe it's like an L2 to L10 or something like that. So there are all these different uh, markers and typically the higher the number, um, the more experienced you are and the higher you're compensated for that. We definitely did find that that level was most highly correlated with compensation rather than um, even experience or time at the company. Okay, that makes sense. Now, um, it's also kind of, this This I found fascinating that uh, a common tactic seems to be that employees will start at Microsoft and then they'll hop over to another company, mm -hmm. sort of go up one or two levels um, in this very strange leveling system. Uh, and then they will get rehired by the company and come back in at a higher value or at a, at a higher compensation maybe than they would have if they had just stayed at the company itself. Are you finding that this is a common tactic across sort of the whole landscape of, of these tech companies or is this particular to, to Microsoft? 
I think it's a, it's I've heard from everyone who works in the Seattle area um, in you know past reporting as well that this is something that's common, especially in Seattle because if you think about the two major tech companies there um, that have are kind of. Uh, based in the greater Seattle area, it's Microsoft and Amazon. Um, and a lot of Microsoft employees will ping over to Amazon and then stay there for a year or two and come right back at hopefully a higher level. Um, I mean, on paper, it makes sense. You know, you get new experiences, you work in a different organization, you learn you know, new things, and then you come back and apply that to your job at Microsoft. I mean, whether that's the plan or it's just, you know, kind of a, a play for more compensation. That's probably debatable on a case by case basis, but it's definitely a very common thing in Seattle. Um, and I, I think that in a lot of ways that the tech industry is kind of too nascent to know whether this is a strategy or not. I mean, Google has been a company for 20 years, so we don't have a long history of this, whether this ping ponging is uh, kind of in, uh, present at every tech company, but for companies like Amazon and Microsoft that have been a little bit around a little bit longer than your Facebooks and your Googles. I think that it's, um, it's definitely a, a strategy that we've seen in play. Yeah, my, my next question kind of has, has to do with kind of from a broad perspective about the U S as compares to other, other countries. I feel like in the U S it's very, like it's very known that, that it's kind of taboo to share your, yes. your compensation, you know, companies, I don't know how, if companies w you know, would prefer for employees to not do it, if they would side on the side, the side of, yeah, we'd rather you keep that to yourself. Employees don't necessarily feel comfortable. You know, people don't feel comfortable sharing that information. It seems like hyper personal and too much information yet in other parts of the world, like it's pretty common. It's pretty normal to share uh, share salary information. There, there is no taboo there. Documents like this, and this is not the first time that we've heard of this, make me feel like maybe perspectives on that are shifting. Do you get that? Do you get that impression? I do. I think that there is a lot more of a uh, trend towards workers talking to them to, to each other about issues that aren't just about work. I mean, yeah. it's, it, this isn't like water cooler talk, but this is talking about you know how the actions that they're taking in their office uh, impact climate change. You see the climate marches coming tomorrow yeah. and these walkouts that are being planned. I mean, that's a, a form of worker organization that is, you know, similar to what you see when people unionize, you know, uh, data sharing and, and salary sharing like this is also a, a pre-union tactic. Like I think that this is the first step or one of many first steps towards like more formal uh, worker organization at uh, within the tech industry. And I think that this is kind of a, a pretty, in something as personal as salary information, um, I think is an especially important step. And I think that's what we tried to get at at the crux. And the crux of what makes this story interesting is that these, this is not just an isolated incident. This is, you know, this has been happening at Google. This has been happening, you know, elsewhere online in non- um, insular environments for, for tech workers. Um, so it, I think it, it's something that is that should be looked at as a predecessor to, to greater organization. So this is uh, the first step. You you know you hop in this anonymized spreadsheet. You include your information. You see other folks' information, or you go to uh, levels .fyi and share that information there. I'm curious, what's the next step? What do employees do after they know that they are or aren't being uh, compensated fairly? Is this something that actually does lead to action in the end where an employee takes this information to their manager? Do we see that happening or is it just kind of the, the first step of, oh, okay. Uh, and, you know, is there, is there a sort of a typical response that happens after uh, folks start to share their information? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't speak to every tech worker's experience with this, but um, an anecdote that, that one of the levels that FYI co-founders said was that th they had a friend that was going to get a job at, at a, a major tech company. Uh, I think it might have been Apple. And they looked at levels at FYI and they saw, wow, when I am negotiating what they had offered me um, is a little bit lower. And they ended up getting you know tens of thousands of dollars more added to their salary um because of this information that they had so i mean information is obviously power right. and it's the ability to know what someone of your experience should be compensated at and that, i mean that has a material change um for when you're going into a uh 
negotiation where you typically don't really have any power because the tech because the, the any company kind of holds the cards um in 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 that uh negotiation yeah well uh, i want to thank you so much for joining us dave and uh, if people are looking to follow you online where might they do so um you can follow along at one zero dot medium dot com or uh, my personal Twitter, which is Dave Gershgorn, G-E-R-S-H-G-O-R-N. Um, and that's on Twitter. So uh, those are the easiest, easiest places to find me. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Talk to you soon, Dave. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. You too. All right. Coming up, Apple Arcade launched just today, like moments ago, basically, and it's got a lot of a po positive attention. We're going to talk about why that is in a moment. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. So you can give your users the seamless online experience that they want. We love Cashfly here. We've been using them for years. You can power your site or app with Cashfly CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. No matter what industry your business is in, if your website is directly tied to company revenue, you can give your customers the fast downloads that they need with Cashfly. Cashfly CDN delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods, up to 30% faster than other major CDNs. It's backed by a 100% SLA. Cashfly guarantees the best user experience for all of your customers, no matter where they are or what device they're on. Uh, it's just seamless. And you can join the thousands of others who trust Cashfly's reliable network, including LG, Microsoft, Adobe, Ars Technica, this company that you know of called Twit. <laughs> yes, Leo. <laughs> Leo loves Cashfly. We love Cashfly because they've just been rock solid for all of our podcasts. We've been hosting our, our audio, our video content, our MP3 files, uh, everything over the years on Cashfly for a decade. Uh, every month, our viewers and listeners, that's you, download petabytes of data fast and flawlessly. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't really be here, especially at this scale, without Cashfly. Cashfly in our corner. Say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week or worse, even daily trying to track your CDN usage. Uh, you won't get billing spikes. You'll get a custom plan that's tailored to your CDN needs based on yearly usage trends. And uh, the on average, customers who switch to Cashfly save more than 20%. You can imagine what you could do with that 20% and your time. Just for Twit listeners, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends so you can see if you're overpaying 20% or more for CDN. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. That's twit.cashfly.com. And we thank Cashfly for their support and all of these wonderful years here at Twit. Uh, thank you, Cashfly. Now, Apple's latest addition to its subscription services lineup, Apple Arcade, as you mentioned, launches today. So for five bucks a month, you can play games upon games upon games. Download it from the <laughs> Apple App Store. They're all ad-free and with no freemium in-app purchases. Nice. We are joined by Ian Sheriff CNET, who had a chance to talk to some of the people behind the games in Apple Arcade. Hello, Ian. Hi, how are you doing? Oh, just peachy. Thanks for being here. That's a nice shot, Ian. Yeah, that That's looks very cool. Yeah, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of stuff behind me, but you know, <laughs> it looks great. It's <laughs> magic. It's framed well, right? It's really yeah. good square. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> now, up first, I would love it if you could just give us a quick summary of your thoughts on Apple Arcade's offerings. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I think what really makes Apple Arcade stand out as a as a service is that. You know, everyone who is doing video game services out there, and there's a bunch of them, right? There's Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, uh, Ubisoft one it has one, EA has one. There's just all of these ones. And all of them kind of rely on their back catalog of games, right? If you want to play all the Assassin's Creed games or if you want to play Halos or Gears of War or whatever, you, you have access to the service. And then they often give you new games too. What Apple's doing is something very different. First off, they're offering something that's just... Uh, designed for their devices, right? So it's the phones, the tablets, the computers. But on top of that, it doesn't have a back catalog. These are all new games that Apple has helped to fund the development of. And some of them are from people, you know, like Capcom, and they've got names like Lego and Frogger. But for the most part, they're actually just new stuff. And it's a really interesting approach to this because it really raises the question, are people willing to pay five bucks a month for something to play a bunch of games they may never have heard of? 
Yeah, it is a bit of a, a shot in the dark there. And I wonder then, is that what's behind the one month free? I think it doesn't hurt, right? And if you look at the way Apple's approaching all of this stuff, even with their Apple TV Plus, which they're giving away a year free if you buy a new device from them, uh, very clearly they are trying to hook you, right? Mm -hmm. And in both cases, by the way, they don't have those back catalogs, right? Netflix has Friends and Seinfeld and whatever else. It, Apple doesn't have that stuff. So it, I think it's going to be really fascinating. And one of the other things that I was really looking at is that there's the sense of how the App Store is played out. You know, a lot of the games at the top of the App Store right now are freemium games, right? You were just talking about this, where you download for free, but you have to pay extra for extra lives or diamonds, gems, whatever, to get <laughs> further in the game. And it's annoying to some people, right? And only a small percentage of people pay for those those items, but they make up a, a you know enough money to fund a company. Uh, Apple's saying, you know what? Let's try and go for the way games are on consoles, right? Let's have these story-driven, immersive games that are designed with a beginning and an end and all of that type of stuff and see if people really want that. And I think Apple's creating a market for these types of games that unfortunately has not succeeded so far in the App Store. Most of the people who have games that you pay fully for, they struggle. And it's really good to see, I think, Apple try to at least support that genre. Now I'm I'm an Android user, but I use <gasps> I know how how dare I always me forget that. Look, uh, nobody's perfect. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right, all right, fine. <laughs> hey, look, I use a MacBook and I have a Mac Mini in the other room, so I'm I'm, I'm in the Apple he has ecosystem. No Apple stuff. Be quiet. <laughs> My question is about the uh, the value proposition here. So yeah. obviously Apple Arcade is is available on iPhones, and I imagine that's what a, a good majority of, of, of subscribers are going to be using it on iPhones and iPads. But for people who don't have those, like is the value still there if they have like a MacBook or, or something along those lines? Are all these games going to work equally on all the different platforms? Uh, or is one platform just better for this than others? Well, that's going to be an interesting thing. You know, Apple, uh, you know, they have said that this is going to, the games are going to work across the devices. Yeah. So I suspect that they are not going to just say, oh, you know, throw it on the computer, whatever, who cares? I think they're going to make sure, especially with this first kind of round of games, that they're going to make sure that these games are really going to work well on all of these devices. And it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out further. Uh, Apple computers generally have not been known as a gaming platform, yeah. even though, it, for those of us who know a little bit of history, Halo originally debuted on a Mac uh, before it was bought by Microsoft and then on the Xbox. Oh. So, you know, the, 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 there is Learned history there, but yeah. for the most part, Apple has not been known as a video game platform when it comes to their computers. So it would be interesting to see that happen. I imagine, though, most of the attention will be on the iPhones, iPads, and Apple TVs. Hmm. Now, this is a fascinating thing. Uh, Leo Laporte and I had a, an opportunity to play around with Apple Arcade earlier this week. And one of the things that we kind of realized was with all these games available in, the, in Apple Arcade, some of the games that exist outside of the space are maybe, uh, it could get a little dodgy. So I guess my question to you is, what is the benefit of being part of the Apple Arcade you know, launch or eventually going there and what's the benefit of just staying in the App Store and not going there? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I've written about this on CNET before. The marketing muscle of Apple is is not to be toyed with. And I think that that is one of the things to really keep in mind. There's actually a button for Apple Arcade on the App Store now. And the App Store is one of the one of the really I mean, you think about there's a billion people using this thing. It's really good marketing space, right? And uh, both Google and Apple have really worked hard to make it that way for their respective devices. So I think that if you're part of this thing, you're part of that tab, Apple's actually gonna have a system in place that recommends a recommendation engine uh, for new games. So as new games come out, I don't know what it'll look like, but I imagine something similar to what Netflix does. It emails me when it gets a TV show that I might like. Uh, it's gonna be really interesting to see how that plays out, especially for people who are not part of it. But I imagine the way Apple's going approach this, and the, they've, I imagine they've thought this through, uh, the games that are you pay for fully, uh, like Monument Valley and stuff like that, the, 
most of them just haven't been able to succeed. I've talked to enough developers now to know that if your game isn't free to download, you have very low chances of success. Monument Valley was really a, a, an outlier. So I think Apple, by the way that they're approaching this, they're letting the freemium market continue doing what it's doing, but they're giving these people who don't want to do freemium an opportunity to really blossom. And hopefully it'll work. I mean, I would like to see everyone succeed, right? But it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Sina, you guys have uh, had some kind of exclusive interviews with some of the developers that are creating games. And that's where, where my question really comes from. I'm really curious to know how developers are approaching this from, from a from a revenue perspective, like there's so much money to be made in pay to play or free or right. free to play. Um, yet Apple has insane amounts of money. So I'm sure there was some sort of upfront like deal, like, Hey, make us a game. We're going to give you this boatload of money. Like, is there any indication or is it just tied up in secrecy? What their, what the, what their deals were like, like a lot of money up front or, you know, shaving something off the, the monthly sur the subscription costs. Like how is this beneficial to them outside of just the fact that Apple's marketing muscle can expose their, their work to so many new people? Yeah. I mean, you, you have to imagine we, we tried hard to find out that oh, I'm information. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the uh, knowing how the video game industry works, uh, if we take Xbox and Sony and Nintendo as examples they often will fund the development or some of it and then also have royalties after that. So it, I, I don't know exactly how Apple Arcade is structured, but um, you know, it's, it's a good bet to believe that that is how it, part of this is going on. And look, I mean, Apple is a company that's not known for letting its profits sink, right? They don't, right. They don't like losing their margins. So I imagine that Apple is gonna turn out fine. I think the question will be, what are these companies going to look like in a year, right? Are there going to be companies that are able to succeed? And by the way, this is not the only world where this is a question. Uh, you look at virtual reality, you know, Oculus, uh, uh, Facebook is funding a lot of games. Uh, and there's an ongoing question about whether or not the market itself is sustainable enough to allow that to exist without the funding from Oculus and other companies. Uh, right now, that's a real question. And I think it's the same case with Apple Arcade. Yeah. Yeah. Now there is, and you, you mentioned this in the, in the article, there's concern that, oh boy, we've got one extra subscription service to add huh. to, yeah. to the pot. Um, one of the things that I see Apple trying to do maybe with this is uh, really emphasize, I mean, every time they announced a, a new service, they were very clear to say, and you can get it for your family. And there are other right. subscription services that do that. But I, I really feel like that's forward in, in Apple's uh, playbook. Do you see sort of any other techniques at play to sort of get people to sign up for another subscription? Or is Apple, like I said, just sort of banking on this uh, one month free idea? And more so, are developers who are uh, playing around in Apple Arcade concerned about subscription fatigue? Yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Definitely Apple's also using price. Um, I, I, you know, $4.99 a month is pretty low, both on the video front with Apple TV Plus and with the video games. And I think that that's one thing that they're gonna really try and do. You know, there's the, there's the oft used and very annoying to hear, well, it's, you know, just a cup of coffee. And I, I think that <laughs> it'll be it'll be interesting to see how people approach this. You know, um, there's definitely a question of subscription fatigue. You know, I've talked to a lot of executives who are either involved in subscriptions or are 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 on the outside looking in, or somehow even doing their own. And every one of them realizes that there is a big battle coming for my money. And we don't want 40 subscriptions. We want, want like two, three or four. And the question will be just who wins out, right? And a lot of people believe that that back catalog thing, right? Having in the video world, Seinfeld and friends and all that stuff is gonna really matter. Uh, we just heard yesterday the, amount, the insane amount of money spent on that, uh, the Big Bang Theory, right? To have that back catalog. And I think that the video game world is, is somewhat similar, but you know, whatever is the new hotness also tends to be really popular too. So maybe Apple will be able to make this work. And, and you know, in some way they might even find a monument value in there and then it becomes a go-to thing because they say that these games 
are exclusive to Apple when it comes to mobile. So uh, that's going to be really fascinating too. Yeah, something to uh, to watch. I want to thank you so much for joining us, Ian Share. And uh, if people want to uh, follow you online, how might they do so? Well, it, it's really easy. It's just my name, Ian Sher, on uh, Twitter or any social network, really. So I, I try to make it easy. And of course, I'm on CNET, too. Excellent. Well, we appreciate uh, you giving us a little look inside Apple Arcade. And I guess we'll put the cabinet back together now. And we're good. Thank you so much uh, for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. <laughs> All right. A couple of stories of the week. Uh -huh. Can't wait to get to yours, but I'm going to go first. Podcasts, if you didn't know, are kind of cool. You know, They're all right. Just saying. Yeah. Uh, along with this renewed energy right now around podcast companies looking to tailor tools for podcasters, one such company is Descript, a startup created by Groupon founder Andrew Mason. It just announced $15 million in funding aimed at growing the business even further. Descript offers audio editing tools for podcasters that change how audio editing is done instead of using waveforms. And, and, you know, little tools like select, cut, copy, paste, that sort of stuff. Descript manages audio editing by way of speech to text Whoa. recognition that actually prints the words on screen inside of an editor, making it possible to edit audio in the same way that you edit an email, Whoa. which is really nuts. Uh, you highlight a word, you delete it, the word is extracted from the recording audio, all that kind of stuff. Super neat. And I'm an audio nerd, so I just find this really fascinating. Uh, it was also just announced that Descript acquired Lyrebird. That's a company that's focused on synthetic voice generation oh technology that can listen to a person's voice by way of a number of audio samples and then regenerate a <laughs> synthetic voice for that person. <laughs> and now you can understand what that might be useful for. Deep Desc fakes. Yes, Descript has a new beta feature that will allow users to literally change the spoken words of a podcaster inside the software on the fly. The feature is called Overdub and uh, in some ways calls into question what a podcast really is, right? Because I'm freaking out. Isn't it interesting? I'm so fascinated by this. Um, is a podcast real people talking to each other, uh, you know, recording and releasing that audio or is a podcast the audio equivalent of something like written journalism oh my where word. you can sit down, edit it, refine it after the fact, bring, bring up a totally single sanitized version that's ready for release. That's kind of, kind of seems in some ways the direction that Descript thinks it's heading. What do you think? And I, I think that it depends on the kind of podcast that you like. Totally, totally. For me, I'm Wouldn't not work. into those super scripted shows. Yeah. I like to be the fly on the wall listening to two people um, uh, have a conversation. Yeah. And those little things removed from it makes it feel so... Because I think the beauty of a, of a podcast is the intimacy that you have yes. with the, the people. Hello out there. And <laughs> I have them right in my ear and I really feel connected to them. And if suddenly it's Micah, but it's not Micah, that's, ooh, that oh, kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies. But, but, but will you know but that it's will, not Micah? <laughs> perhaps it is not me right now. In fact, this yes. is a simulation that you're watching. Then it, I guess they have this, uh, like it can interplay with video as well, though when an no. edit is made, when an edit is made, there is a jump cut. I could totally see that. Oh, at YouTubers some point. are going to go wild with yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, pretty interesting. Um, they do say, however, that they are protecting against deep fakes. So, this is thankfully, this is not the kind of thing where you've got a single podcaster recorded on a timeline, learn that audio, and then redo it in order to train it. Um, I, if, if I wanted to train it on my voice or someone wanted to train it on my, my voice, it would have to have me sitting in front of the computer with the software and it sends out in real time sentences that it generates that you have to. So you have to be there in order to recite the sentences in your voice oh. in order for it to learn it. So you can't just feed it a bunch of audio and say, learn this audio. Uh -huh. Now be this person. Oh. I have to actually be there. So that's my consent is sitting there saying the sentences as it generates it. So then... Okay. Yeah. So that protects against deepfakes. That's actually a pretty good protection. I feel like. See, I was gonna, I was gonna have a shot on my face where I'm yeah. making a skeptical look, but that actually does. Now I'm not Seem, feeling as skeptical. Seems like that would work, anyways. Yeah, that feels, I don't know how you'd manufacture that in advance. Right. Yet. 
yet. Unless you, <laughs> unless you're like a, I don't know, CSI, then they're like, they type it in and then uh, on the keyboard and then magically it generates it automatically. Yeah. But yeah. Or if you're just life. really good at impersonating that other person, <laughs> yes. then yeah. you feed it, you know, a bunch of stuff and then, you know, maybe that would work. Yeah, I'm but... still working on my impression of you. So it would not, it <laughs> wouldn't have wait. me yet. <laughs> I can't wait to hear this. Never heard anyone uh, do an impression of me before. So I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath. Uh, Descript uh, apparently is also good for automatic transcription. It's just got a really that would good be great. Uh, transcription engine. And uh, if you're interested in checking it out, it's free for up to four hours. Then it's $10 a month after that. So it's not that expensive. I think but... I'm going to have to just get give it a try. Yeah, just to I'm see curious. what it's all about. I'm super curious about it too. It's really fascinating. Yeah, because one of the things that I really like, um, Apple Podcasts recently added this, and I think some of the other platforms may do this already, but they just added the ability to, when you search in the Apple Podcasts app, it actually is using transcription so you uh, can find a show based on what you're looking for love not it. just the the metadata right um and Google's so doing see, that too yeah. yeah and so i see tools like this being very helpful um not only for for you know just being discoverability of podcasts but we are missing we are excluding um an audience of folks who may want to consume podcasts who have low or no hearing Mm -hmm. And oh, so yeah. the ability to make our podcast available to folks who are able to read a transcript of the podcast, I think that'd be wonderful. Totally. So any tools that totally make that agree. more possible, I think is great. Yeah. There's so much automatic transcription happening right now. Mm -hmm. And the thing is it now it's good. Like yeah, it's finally yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. You see some of the the stuff. I mean, it's embedded into Android now, you know, That's Android right. 10. I was so pumped about that. I remember seeing captions. that. Yeah. The live um, captions is fantastic, which, you know, and that, that is kind of speaking exactly to what you're talking about. It's kind of like platform wide. It's like anything that's, you know, that's audio related on your phone, whether you're watching a video or listening to a podcast or, you know, some other u user interface thing or whatever. Like, it's just kind of like there, just spitting it back at you. So it's just cool that we're there at this it point. It is cool. It like, is it's got to cool. be great for, from living an accessibility in standpoint. It's got to be like, thank you. My wishes have been granted. Yeah. You know? About time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I am excited. So um, I. I ordered something online. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was giving myself a, a little gift to celebrate the hundredth episode <laughs> of Tech News Weekly, I oh, guess. So sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. There we go. So I'm going to open this package. First of oh, all, boy. hold on, Should let I me be rip, scared? I'm going to rip off the sticker so you can't see. Actually, okay, I just saw a warning message on the sticker. All I saw was the exclamation point. Now I'm afraid that like, there's keep like a away, battery that's going to explode. Keep away from Jason Howell. Okay. Um, because he might try to eat the plastic and that's dangerous. I don't that's do what that, it says. by the way. That's that's not a me thing to that's, eat plastic. I don't. Well, that's what it says. I don't know what to tell you. I realize we're, we're still getting to know each other and everything, but, <laughs> but I definitely like, don't eat plastic. Thank you for letting me know that. Uh, I am hungry for lunch, so you never know. Okay, now the sticker has been removed, so All go right. ahead and give this a feel. Don't read the sticker. There's still some on there. Okay. Oh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, oh, uh, oh, I know. <laughs> I know what it is. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is not my first guess. Banana oh. rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> dun, you did it. You did it. Micah ordered. It's the stretchy banana, y'all. <laughs> Here, you grab one How side. How on earth did banana become the thing that we hang this show on? <laughs> now you have to have trust in order to do this with somebody. Yeah, don't let go. Oh, no. See, oh my God. Yeah, so then it does that. And then uh, <laughs> I promise you it, it goes back into its normal form if you kind of, like, if you work with it a little bit. Uh, <laughs> it's, they, they are weird. They are weird, right? <laughs> this is a stress-relieving banana. Yes. Um, and for some reason, it came with a free bouncy ball that so, says... I'll just give you a tip. Oh, you give it a little roll. <laughs> so weird. Uh, there you go. There's your banana back in full form again. Wow, look at it. See? See? Not edible. <laughs> it is scented. But it's more At like first, lemons. I thought it was like magnetic sand. You know the magnetic oh, sand yeah. stuff. My kids are way into that stuff. It really felt like that, and it kind of is. It's just it's vacuum sealed, right? Like okay. so. It's, yeah, don't give it to a cat. Yeah, you're gonna run into an issue if you do so. And and warning, like at some point when when you when you've been so stressful that you've worked 
the banana enough, uh, there will be a hole at some point in it, oh, and it won't no. ever It'll regain never its return normal shape to again. Normal. And that's why you buy a pack of 10 of them instead of just one, <laughs> yes. apparently. That's why they sell a jumbo pack. <laughs> Your jumbo pack of stress-relieving bananas. Well, I'm happy that you decided to get one. <laughs> yes. uh, I'm finally, happy I decided to get one. Finally, you can put that in your lapel <laughs> and and creep out the world with a stretchy, <laughs> floppy banana. It kind of looks like lapel. a slug. It really does. Banana slug. Yes, it looks like a banana slug. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, boy. And on that note, I think we're done. Yeah? It's time to say yeah? goodbye. Okay, goodbye, banana. Uh, Tech News Weekly publishes every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. That's where you can go to subscribe to the show in audio and video formats. And we hope that you do. If you haven't already, that's what you need to do. Guess what? You can be a part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. And of course, following us on social media at twit. And if you want to tweet at me after you've bought your own stress-relieving banana <laughs> or not, you can do that at Micah Sargent on Twitter and other social media places. That's right. I'm at Jason Howell on... Oh, sorry. There I'm at go. Jason Howell on Twitter. Uh, thanks to everybody who helps out each and every day. Jeff, John, thanks to Masako for capturing all of this. I'm sure it's going to be on social media later. You might even find it on Instagram, twit.tv. We'll see you next week on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> That's exercise. <laughs> <laughs> You're not at the gym right now. It I know it like seems it. that way. <laughs> it does. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Cool. That was 100th episode. Went out with a with a with, with a, a banana with a banana a, bang a banana bang. Darn it! No. <laughs> there we go. <laughs>